The popular TV show South Park has an episode titled All About Mormons, in which Joseph Smith's account of the coming forth of the Book of Mormon is mocked as absurd and completely unbelievable. For many people, Joseph Smith's claims are just too ridiculous, and the South Park episode effectively captures this incredulous attitude. But what is the actual history of the coming forth of the Book of Mormon? And is there evidence that supports Joseph Smith's claim that the book is an authentic translation? As Joseph Smith explained, in September 1823, an angel named Moroni appeared to him and told him about an ancient record written on plates of gold and buried in a hill near the Smith family farm in Manchester, New York. Joseph said that the next day, Moroni led him to the hill and showed him the gold plates along with translation instruments he described as being two stones and silver bows. But Joseph wasn't permitted to take the plates or the translation instruments for another four years. And so, in the spring and summer of 1828, Joseph, with Martin Harris and his wife Emma working as his scribes, began the translation of the Book of Mormon. Those involved with the translation of the Book of Mormon said that Joseph initially used the stones found with the plates. Those stones were later described as spectacles, or the Urim and Thummim, and in the Book of Mormon they are simply called interpreters. At some point, however, Joseph began translating with another seer stone he had used in money digging and folk magic practices during his youth. Be sure to check out the link to the church's gospel topics essay that explains Joseph's use of the seer stones if you're interested or unfamiliar with this topic. Although it's not always clear which translation instrument he was using and when, the eyewitnesses described how Joseph would place the seer stone in a hat and press his face into the brim of the hat to shield out external light. He would then read off words to his scribe as they appeared in the stone. Although this sounds odd, it does strengthen the claim that Joseph did not personally write the Book of Mormon, as he could not use reference materials of any kind in such a position. It's crucial to understand that the eyewitnesses involved in the production of the Book of Mormon all firmly maintained that Joseph was not reading from any book or manuscript but instead dictated the text to his scribe as it was revealed to him in the translation instruments. The translation was then completed in June 1829, a copyright for the Book of Mormon having been secured on June 11th. What's so remarkable about this part of the translation of the Book of Mormon is the breakneck pace of the work. The translation of the text during this time was completed in an astounding 65 to 72 working days. Based on the number of pages in the 1830 edition of the Book of Mormon, that puts the rate of the translation of the Book of Mormon at seven or eight pages a day. In addition to eyewitness testimony that Joseph and Oliver did not stop to make revisions, the evidence seen in their surviving original manuscript of the Book of Mormon confirms the rapid speed in which the book was translated. The original manuscript shows smooth flowing text and the kinds of mistakes a scribe makes when hearing a rapid dictation. In July and August of 1829, Joseph Smith approached a number of local printers to contract the publication and sale of the Book of Mormon. Besides printers in nearby Rochester, New York, Joseph also approached the Palmyra publishers Egbert B. Grandin and Jonathan Hadley. On August 11th, 1829, Hadley published a short description of his encounter with Joseph Smith in his newspaper, The Palmyra Freeman. Quoting either Joseph himself or someone else associated with the translation, Hadley wrote, It was said that the leaves of the Book of Mormon were plates of gold, about eight inches long, six wide, and one eighth of an inch thick, on which were engraved characters or hieroglyphics. By placing the spectacles in a hat and looking into it, Smith could, he said so at least, interpret these characters. In that same account, Hadley sneered that Joseph Smith was very illiterate and his claims fraudulent. However, even if he personally disbelieved Joseph's description of the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, Hadley provided a contemporary non-Mormon account of the translation of the Book of Mormon that corroborates the later Mormon accounts very nicely. Eventually, E.B. Grandin agreed to print 5,000 copies of the Book of Mormon for the price of $3,000 and on March 26, 1830, Grandin announced the publication and sale of the Book of Mormon in his newspaper, The Wayne Sentinel. 
From all of this, a strong case can be made for the authenticity of Joseph Smith's account of the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. First, the eyewitness testimony of those directly involved with the translation unanimously agree that Joseph was not copying from another book or manuscript, but rather that he dictated the text of the Book of Mormon as he peered into the seer stone. Second, the astonishingly rapid pace of the dictation of the text from April to June 1829 can only be described as miraculous given the Book of Mormon's intricate narrative, its interweaving timelines and chronologies, its profound teachings, and its subtle literary complexity. Third, the evidence uncovered in the original manuscript confirms the testimony given by eyewitnesses. It is clear from the surviving manuscript that Joseph was dictating a text at a rapid pace and did not go back to make any revisions. In addition to all of these, the historical record also indicates that Joseph and his associates were unaware of the contents of the Book of Mormon as they were translating. This makes the dictation of the text all the more remarkable, as it is next to impossible to imagine that Joseph just made up a text as intricate as the Book of Mormon on the fly. Any naturalistic theories explaining the translation would be more plausible if they could argue from the premise that Joseph took a lot of time, had a lot of privacy, was working in the luxury of a setting with diverse resources, and had the freedom to make as many revisions as needed. However, none of this bears out once you look at the actual documented history. Thanks to the painstaking efforts of historians and other scholars, it is safe to say that Joseph Smith's claims are more lucid, straightforward, and based on the best evidence than a silly cartoon would have you believe. The burden of proof to articulate a coherent counter-explanation based on just as compelling historical evidence now rests on skeptics who simply dismiss Joseph Smith's claims out of hand. Taken together, this evidence indicates, as Joseph testified throughout his life, that the Book of Mormon came forth and was translated by the gift and power of God. Hey, thanks for watching this episode of Evidences of the Book of Mormon. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to like and subscribe and help us make more videos by donating. Thank you.